Hey guys, I'm Chris. Hey everybody, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. And we are bringing you some anthology horror this October. And we're starting with one of my favorite movies from when I was a little gay boy. Tales from the Dark Side. Right. The and movie. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it is. It's Tales from the Dark Side, colon, the movie. <laughs> Which, of course, my hypothesis is that nothing that ends with the movie can be very good. But I'm thinking there are some rare exceptions. Um, maybe. And maybe just slightly. Mm, There's okay. nothing, like, Oscar-worthy. That's Exception called. adjacent. <laughs> Exception. <laughs> anyway, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, is a 1990 American horror anthology film directed by John Harrison and written by George A. Romero and... Michael McDowell, and based on the television series created by Romero that ran in syndication from 1984 to 1988. The film features three vignettes told by a young boy to a witch who is planning to eat him, and two of the stories are based on works by Arthur Conan Doyle and Stephen King, with a third story that was influenced by Japanese folklore. The movie's cast was stacked and featured performances by Debbie Harry, Julianne Moore, Christian Slater, James Remar, Radon Chong, and Steve Buscemi. Okay, listeners, the rest of your nine lives are going in one lump sum. This is Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. (laughs) Stephen King, originator of Pet Cemetery. (gasps) Arthur Conan Doyle, author of Sherlock Holmes. Michael McDowell, creator of Beetlejuice. George Romero, director of Night of the Living Dead. Now, these four masters of everlasting horror bring to the screen four tales of overwhelming terror. (laughs) I warned them, but they wouldn't listen. Tales of diabolical fate. You promised you'd never die! Tales of ghastly revenge. Grow, O light. Rise, O light. Come forth, O light. Open his eyes. Tales of ruthless evil. That cat has killed three people in this household. I don't believe this. Kill it. Bury it. And bring me its tail. Tail, tail, tail. Tales from the dark side. Well, that just about takes care of that, doesn't it? Come live the nightmare of your choice. (laughs) Tales from the dark side. (laughs) The movie. Betty, played by Deborah Harry, an affluent suburban housewife and modern-day witch with a heart of glass, is planning a dinner party for her fellow witches. The main chorus is to be Timmy, played by Matthew Lawrence, a young boy whom she has captured and locked in her pantry, constantly feeding him cookies to fatten him up in time for him to be put in her oven. In an effort to stall her from stuffing and roasting him, Timmy offers to tell her a story from a book that she gave him titled... Tales from the Dark Side. The book. She said the thing. (laughs) She accepts. But one way or another, she's gonna eat him. (laughs) You're so much better at this than I am. (laughs) The boy's first story is an adaption of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's 1892 short story, Lot Number 249. In a prestigious university, graduate student Edward Bellingham, played by Steve Buscemi, a collector and seller of antiques and historical artifacts, has recently been cheated out of a fellowship he had hoped to win. The winner, a wealthy student named Lee, played by Robert Sedgwick, was able to win after the discovery of an anonymous tip accusing Bellingham of the theft of a pre-Columbian Zuni fetish from the campus museum. 
Lee and his friend Andy, played by Christian Slater, visit Bellingham after a round of tennis, who congratulates Lee's victory of the Fellowship. He invites them inside to observe his latest purchase, a large crate labeled Lot 249. Opening the crate, the trio discover that its contents include an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus with a mummy inside. Unnerved, Lee leaves Bellingham's room and meets with his girlfriend Susan, played by Julianne Moore, who not only happens to be Andy's sister, but who also wrote Lee's winning essay for him and left the anonymous tip that accused Bellingham. Bellingham unwraps the mummy and roots through the mummy's bussy to remove his innards. He discovers that the incision contains a parchment scroll containing a message written in hieroglyphics. Later that night, Bellingham manages to translate the message on the scroll, revealing that it is an incantation to reanimate the dead, which Bellingham recites, causing the mummy to come to life. Hearing commotion, Susan and Andy run into Bellingham, who states that a thief must be in the building. Susan uses the opportunity to plant the Zuni fetish she accused Bellingham of stealing in his dorm room. The mummy makes its way to Lee's dorm, who arms himself with a tennis racket. The mummy ultimately discovers Lee and kills him by removing his brain through his nose with a wire hanger. No wire hangers ever! Returning to the dorm house, Susan discovers Lee's brain in a bowl of fruit and his corpse soon after. She also manages to spot the mummy as it makes its way back to Bellingham's room. The next day, Susan tells Andy that she saw Lee's killer. At the same time, Bellingham is interrogated by the museum curator and the dean of students over the stolen fetish, the latter of whom expels him. Meanwhile, the mummy, having escaped the wrath of Joan Crawford, <laughs> confronts Susan and slashes her back open with scissors, filling the womb with chrysanthemums. Hearing his sister scream, Andy races back to the dorm where he discovers her corpse, crudely wrapped in bandages and filled with chrysanthemums. Putting everything together, Andy ambushes Bellingham and knocks him unconscious, then ties him to a chair and douses him with lighter fluid, intending to burn him alive as revenge for Susan and Lee's deaths and fill him with chrysanthemums. <laughs> Bellingham, Bellingham recites, <laughs> Bellingham... <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping you'd have a harder time with that weird chrysanthemum. <laughs> Super gay, I can say that. Bellingham, Bellingham begins reciting the incantation, bringing the mummy back to life. Andy, however, has come prepared and dismembers the mummy with a battery-powered carving knife, putting its head in the fireplace along with some chrysanthemums. <laughs> he later... He then burns the scroll with the incantation written on it, then considers killing Bellingham, but is talked out of it. The next day, Bellingham leaves the university and says farewell to Andy, telling him that he'll never have to deal with him again, but he'll find a way to stay in touch. However, inside his taxi, a giggling Bellingham recites the incantation, revealing that Andy had burned the wrong scroll. Back at the university, Andy is confronted in his dorm by a reanimated Susan and Lee, who tells him that Bellingham sends his regards and chrysanthemums. <laughs> Back in Betty's kitchen, despite knowing that Timmy is trying to stall his death, Betty tells the boy that he told the story very well. Timmy mentions that people will come looking for him if he isn't home by 6 p.m., but he is scared into silence when Betty opens the oven. Timmy manages to stall some more by convincing her to let him tell another story, an adaption of Stephen King's 1977 short, The Cat from Hell. Halston, played by David Johansson, an assassin, is driven by taxi to a large mansion. He is invited inside by the mansion's owner, Drogan, played by William Hickey, a wealthy wheelchair-bound old man who happens to be the president of a large pharmaceutical company. In the parlor, Drogan tells Halston that he wants him to make a hit. When told that his victim is right behind him, Halston discovers the only thing there is a big black pussy. <laughs> Drogan offers Halston... <laughs> Drogan offers... Drogan offers... <laughs> Drogan offers Halston an envelope containing $50,000 and explains to him that the cat is what he wants killed, 
promising him an additional 50000 if he succeeds. Halston is left in disbelief about the job, prompting Drogon to explain that this particular pussy is murderously evil and how it managed to kill three previous occupants of the mansion. While Halston does not believe the story, he is more than willing to break off a piece of the knife bolt to kill that pussy in exchange for 100,000 smackers. Left alone, Halston goes hunting for the cat in an attempt to kill it via lethal injection, but the cat manages to continually evade or slash him with its claws. Halston attempts to bide his time until the cat comes around again, only for the cat to latch onto and furiously break off a piece of its claws into his dick. Finally, Halston attempts to lure the cat to him with a bowl of food so he can kill it with a laser scoped rifle. But the rifle's bullet actually manages to phase through the cat's body. Halston chases it, firing wildly, but the cat manages to kill him by turning into a muppet, leaping into his mouth and forcing itself down his throat and into his stomach. When Drogon returns the next day to see if the deed is done, he finds Halston's corpse on the floor, face raped by that damn pussy. <laughs> <laughs> a nearby clock chimes 12, causing the cat to awaken and squirm out of the corpse's mouth, along with some chrysanthemums. It spots Drogon and leaps into his lap, viciously screeching at him and in- <laughs> viciously screeching at him and inducing a fatal heart attack. Having gotten its revenge, the cat licks itself peacefully upon Drogon's corpse. Back in Betty's kitchen, Betty is once again impressed by the story, but she also mentions that her favorite stories from the book were love stories, giving Timmy an idea. In an attempt to stall her once more, Timmy offers to tell her one last story, a love story. The third and final segment is an adaption of The Legend of the Yukiana from Lafcadio Hearn's 1904 book, Quite An, Stories and Studies of Strange Things. Preston, played by James Remar, is a struggling artist living in New York City, where a stone gargoyle on a neighboring building watches over him through his apartment's skylight. He receives a call from his agent, Wyatt, who asks to meet him at a bar a few blocks away. At the bar, Wyatt tells Preston that his artwork is unpopular and thus not selling, and ultimately resigns as his agent. Dejected, Preston drinks heavily and becomes inebriated. The bartender, his friend Jer, offers to walk him home. Along the way, Preston stops to relieve himself in a back alley. While Preston is occupied, Jer hears suspicious noises and reaches for his gun. Oh yes, they both reach for the gun. Damn it. <laughs> he sees and shoots at something in the darkness, but ends up losing his hand and begging Preston for help before being gruesomely decapitated. Preston attempts to run from the horrific scene, but is cornered by Jer's killer. A monstrous, muppety gargoyle, who proceeds to corner him. As Preston begs for his life, the gargoyle agrees to spare him, but only if he swears to never tell anyone what he saw, what it looked like, or what it did. Fearing for his life, Preston promises. Satisfied, the gargoyle slashes Preston's chest as a way to ask him to cross his heart, then flies away. Traumatized, Preston vomits in a nearby alley. Trying to make his way back home, Preston runs into another alley where he witnesses a beautiful woman, played by Ray Don Chong, nervously passing by. Still gripped by fear, he grabs and assures her that she will not be harmed. The woman, who gives her name as Toyota Corolla, <laughs> claims that she claims that she got claims that she became lost while going to meet friends and was hoping to find a taxi. Preston introduces himself to Corolla and convinces her to call her a taxi from his apartment. While there, Preston attempts to notify the police about the gargoyle, but as he is still bound by his oath, he is forced to let the police hang up. Corolla discovers the gargoyle inflicted wound on Preston's chest and cleans it. Intoxicated by her new car scent, Preston and Corolla make sweet, sweet love. <laughs> You smell good. <laughs> the next day, Preston briefly leaves Corolla to go out for a walk. 
He discovers Jira's corpse being investigated by police and paramedics, causing him to hurry back inside. Still haunted by Jira's death, but also inspired by his encounter with the gargoyle, Preston begins creating various pieces of artwork detailing the creature. He is also careful to hide them from Corolla, who has decided to move in with him. Preston soon learns that Corolla has friends in the art world, including the owner of one of the largest galleries in the city, and that she also mentioned Preston's work to them. Preston and Corolla are then invited to an opening for a display of Preston's creations, some of which are sold for thousands of dollars. That night, Corolla reveals to Preston that she is pregnant with his child, and he agrees to marry her. Ten years later, Preston and Corolla have two children, and Wyatt has been rehired as Preston's agent. Despite all of his success and happiness, Preston's memories of his encounter with the gargoyle still torture him. That night, Preston breaks down and finally tells Corolla about the gargoyle, as well as the fact that it was what killed Jer and the promise he made with the creature, even showing her a miniature statue of it. Corolla uncomfortably asks why Preston is telling her this, prompting Preston to admit that it's because she is the most important thing in his life, and the only thing he hasn't given her is the truth about that night. Corolla begins weeping, then yells at Preston that he promised never to tell anyone. With Preston's vow broken, and a magnificent display of muppetry, she painfully transforms into the monstrous gargoyle. The children, awoken by Corolla's pained screams, huddle together in terror. A terrified Preston pleads for Corolla to change back, but she says she is unable to. The children begin screaming themselves, causing Preston to discover that they too have been transformed into gargoyles. Corolla wraps her rings around Preston as he proclaims his love for her. Corolla says that she loves him too, but with the vow broken, she is forced to reluctantly kill him by biting his neck. That's how I want to go. Corolla gathers the children and flies out of the apartment through the skylight, emitting a heartbroken wail. Corolla parks, I mean, perches, <laughs> on top of the building, neighboring Preston's apartment. She and the children stare down at Preston's body with sorrowful expressions as they turn to stone. Betty remarks that Timmy did indeed save the best story for last, but he says there is one more story to tell, and this one has a happy ending. She rebuts that none of the stories in that book have happy endings. As Betty advances on Timmy, he makes up his own story and narrates that he has marbles in his pocket. He throws them on the floor, causing Betty to slip and fall on her butcher's block, impaling her on her own tools. Timmy then reaches the keys to the shackles and frees himself, whereupon he pushes Betty into her own oven. Timmy helps himself to a cookie and says, Don't you just love happy endings? Cue the chrysanthemum. <laughs> the end yes <laughs> <laughs> well that was like a 15 minute synopsis Woo! just wait till next week when you we have seven stories to tell well you're gonna be the one that truncates those i removed like whole paragraphs i know and then of course edited everything to make it a little bit better we're gonna make it one of those like uh two sentence stories or whatever just seven of them yeah i you know I really thought you'd have more trouble with chrysanthemums, <laughs> but it just rolls off the tongue, the gay tongue. I'm super fucking queer. I can say chrysanthemums. <laughs> I say it daily. Come on. But you couldn't say like Taiwan. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, know I couldn't say, I couldn't say that word that wasn't in English. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tales from the Dark Side was released on May 4th, 1990 on 1500 screens. It earned 5 million opening weekends, securing the number 3 spot at the box office. Movies opening that spring and summer had to compete with box office juggernaut Pretty Woman, which stayed in the top 5 of the box office for 12 weeks. That movie made a shit ton of money. (laughs) Tales from the Dark Side was a moderate success, staying in the top 10 for several weeks. Ultimately, it would bring in a little more than 16 million against a reported budget of 3.5. So yeah, it worked. Yeah. Tales from the Dark Side has a 43% on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score of 44%. There is no site consensus, but audiences polled by CinemaScore give the film an average grade of C. 
It is not. There have not been many episodes that we have done that have no site consensus. Yeah. Right? Mm. Los Angeles Times writer Michael Wilmington criticized Harrison's directing choices, saying there was too much ritzy film noir styling and self-conscious comic book frames, but said, there's more brain than usual beneath the blood and guts. The Washington Post panned the film, calling it a lame effort. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you, Washington Post. The film won the grand prize at the Aviora's Fantastic Film Festival? Um, so I, I looked that up. At the time, I was making these notes, and now I can't remember what it is, but it's a foreign film festival. Avaraz? Okay. And apparently, uh, it was like the, the best movie that year there. So. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, Laurel Productions initially announced a sequel to the film in October 1990. A screenplay was actually written by the first film screenwriters Michael McDowell and George Romero, along with Grant Wilson. Segments planned included an adaption of Robert Bloch's Almost Human, alongside adaptions of Stephen King's short stories Pinfall, originally planned for Creepshow 2, and Rainy Season. This sequel, however, never came to fruition. I fucking love the short story Rainy Season. Oh, yeah. And I wish that somebody would make some sort of adaption of it. It can't be a full-length movie, but it's about, like, raining frogs, and it's very, very good. You really like that in movies. I do. I do love in frogs from the sky in movies. I mean, (laughs) come on. We're not talking about Magnolias. We're talking about chrysanthemums. <laughs> no, wrong, wrong flower, Robert. <laughs> Queer. So uh, this is a. I, I, I feel like the main story around this movie is its cast. Yes, I have to agree. I feel like this staff. I feel like this cast is very, very stacked. I mean, obviously, there's a story behind the director, and he would go on, and and he made the new Creep Show show on Shutter, which has gotten critical acclaim, mm-hmm. which I still have not seen. Uh, and of course, Stephen King has had Arthur Conan Doyle stories. Like, there's some really good, you know, basis for stuff in this. And of course, Romero is a big part of this. And uh, you know, they they managed to get uh, like probably the best cast of all of these anthologies, I would say. Right, and probably unknowingly, I loved Debbie Harry um, randomly, you know, although she was in the original series. I didn't know that. As far as like a one episode, I think. So. I mean, if we're talking about Tales from the Dark Side, colon, the series, I have only seen like a couple of them. You know, I hear they're really good. But George Romero created that series and it would stand a reason that I would have seen them all by now. But I mean, right around this time, things were so popular as far as like horror anthologies on TV goes, right? Yeah. I remember Tales from the Crypt and Are You Afraid of the Dark? Right. And there was Tales from the Dark Side. There was also a show called Monsters, which ran in syndication around the same time. Interesting. Um, so there was a lot like that, that, that market of like horror TV anthology was kind of packed at yeah. the time. So, well, if you think about it, uh, almost every TV, all TV back then was like a perfected anthology in a way, just mm-hmm. with like consistent wraparound characters, any monster of the week, like uh, Buffy or even more so I would say X-Files, mm-hmm. whereas a very different story, even different setting every week because they're just traveling around the country, you know? always seemingly looking like Vancouver's for some reason. But, you know, still, they have that wraparound with Fox Mulder, you know, and Dana Scully investigating these things, but it's basically an anthology, right? Yeah. Um, But to be an anthology proper, I think it's a different character narrative each time. And then you would have, like, a host, like the Crypt Keeper, right? And they even asked, uh, I think uh, it was uh, Romero who you know, asked this director why he didn't choose to go with a host instead of a, a wraparound. And his, and his answer was that he was inspired by Romero's first creep show mm-hmm. where he really liked the wraparound story of the comic. And that's good. And I like the wraparound story in this. I, I would like to go back and like watch some of the episodes of this TV series um, because I know that like several Stephen King stories became Tales from the Dark Side episodes Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a lot. And I I feel like if we really dove down into some of those episodes, we could probably trace back some other horror figures from like the 90s, early 2000s, having their early start on this particular TV series. I know that's true of Tales from the Crypt, but Tales from the Crypt had HBO money to throw at it. And they were getting people like John Landis and stuff like that to direct their episodes. A lot of stuff came out of these times, right? Like I would say uh, Breaking Bad wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for... Uh, that that showrunner's work on X-Files and seeing Brian Cranston, mm-hmm. a comedic actor, acting dramatic. 
right? And so a lot of things sprung out of these anthologies and these, you know, episodic serialized, almost serialized is the other thing, right? Yeah. Um, well, a serialized, I think it's just more of a continuous story. Yeah. So episodic, right. Monster of the Week, anthology type situations in sci-fi and horror. But uh, yeah, so they, they got Deborah Harry, Debbie Harry, Blondie. <laughs> Uh, you know, Matthew Lawrence went on to do like Boy Meets World and uh-huh. a bunch of other stuff as a kid. Um, we've got Lot 49 with Steve Buscemi, Julianne Moore in her first film ever, Christian Slater, and then apparently Kira Sedgwick's hot ass brother, Robert. <laughs> he is pretty fucking hot in this movie. And Cat from Hell was a much smaller cast, but um, had David Johansson, who's also big in, in pop music, I guess, or not blues, maybe, mm-hmm. is really what it is. And William Hickey, who's done voice work as well as, of course, horror before, as the old man. And then Lover's Vow has James Remar, fresh out of rehab. <laughs> well, because if you recall, in our episode of Aliens, he was originally cast as the main, you know, male lead. Right. And he couldn't because he was caught with, like, heroin or something. And so he said that decision to fire him actually kind of saved his life because he immediately went into rehab and restarted his career. And so this is kind of in the beginnings of him restarting his career again. And I feel like we've either deep dove something or had a bonus episode of a movie with James Remar in it, aside from that comment about aliens, but I can't remember what it is. So talking about it right now is pointless. Well, (laughs) Romero found him, you know, along with this director, Stephen King, you know, and they said, we will help you rebuild your career if you neck this Muppet. (laughs) (laughs) This Muppet played by Ray Don Chong. Who I think is amazing. I love Ray Don Chong. And we were talking about this off mic and it feels, it seems like her filmography is kind of small. Right. But I mean, I really love the movie color purple and she is memorable in that movie and very few scenes. Was it like fire of the gods or something like that or something? Yeah. I mean, I, I really can't remember a whole lot. I just, I really like the way I like her presence. I guess, yeah. Me too. She is she definitely has a, a presence. She has a unique look. So Tales from the Dark Side of the Movie is considered by many fans and, of course, like we said, Tom Savini himself to be the official Creepshow 2, which to me means that we missed Creepshow – or sorry, Creepshow 3, which means we missed Creepshow 2. Yeah, we did not deep dive into Creepshow 2. So we we did a really full episode on Creepshow. And Creepshow 2 to me is – very, very subpar to, oh. to its original. I so, mean, so Creepshow and this one are the best of what you'd call as the loose trilogy there. Right. Yes. I mean, and okay. Creepshow 2 um, has some good stories in it, and it's all Stephen King work again. You know, it's just not near as fun as Creepshow, in my opinion. Have you seen Creepshow 2? No. No. I mean, I feel like you should watch it at some point just because be a completionist or whatever. Yeah. But there was always talk of having a creep show three and it just never really happened. Well, this is it. Yeah. Apparently, right. The spiritual successor following the success of Stephen King and uh, Romero's obviously creep show from 1982, Laurel entertainment that did both creep show and creep show two, uh toyed with the idea of creep show as a television series. And after several negotiations and changes due to the rights holders, the decision was made to change the title of the series to Tales from the Dark Side. So really, Tales from the Dark Side show was supposed to be the creep show show. Oh. Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was to be helmed by none other than, you know, George A. Romero himself. That's right. Jorge himself. Yep. And so after the series' great success, just roughly three short years after Creepshow 2 hit theaters, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, came to fruition in 1990 as the successor of the original two Creepshow installments, sharing many of the same crew as the Creepshow installments. So literally, it is just a name only, not a sequel. And I think by that time, because I I kind of remember in the past, you know, the late 80s, Tells from the Dark Side, I, I definitely knew what it was. I had seen a handful of episodes. I was just a young kid, you know, and I wasn't always up at the time or maybe not had the channel that it was on constantly. But I had seen a couple. And I know by the time I started working in video stores, there were like a couple vignettes that were put onto like tape that I could rent and watch. And those were the ones that I had seen. But it was a fairly popular show. So I'm not surprised yeah. that they would call it Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, instead of Creep Show 3, because that would bring in a totally different market. Based point. on the legalese that had to happen to make it into a TV show. Yeah, right. And so true, all yeah. of it basically is this the the series, the franchise was Creep Show. Um, but now it has been turned into Tales from the Dark Side. So fans should everywhere should 
really recognize these as the same franchise. And I didn't know that going into this. I kind of knew about it just because I like I like all these movies, Creepshow 2 being the least yeah. of my favorites. But like this one and, and uh, the original Creepshow are really, really good. And we should also say that there technically is a Creepshow 3 that was made much, much later after this one. Yeah. And of course, the new show on, on Shudder. Which is excellent. Which we have you seen it? I've seen the first season. The first season is very, very good. Okay. And I have not seen the later ones. But is that the one with the doll? Like the dollhouse? Uh yes. And one of the first episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was really good. I know you've seen some of them. Yeah. yeah. I watched them in Boston. Mm-hmm. Like the first two or three episodes. It's a good show. I mean, like it's and I am a fan of anthology things, you know? Like I I really like anthology horror television. Like it, it makes me happy. Yeah. And I like anthology movies. It's right up there in my top three subgenre, right? Which is why like you know, sometimes in October we'll like talk about anthology film. And after this one, we're kind of going to like start to the dregs of anthology. Like we're really hitting the big ones and it's probably pretty much it after this one. And next well, we'll week, we'll see. We don't have to do everything, you know, we can yeah. kind of switch gears, but and not to belabor the point, but the second story in this called the cat from hell was actually originally intended for creep show too. I didn't know that. Yeah. This, the, but it was dropped because based on budgetary reasons. Yeah, the stories in Creepshow 2, there's like there's there's three stories in that one too. And I, I kind of enjoy anthology movies that have a, a smaller amount of stories, right? Because it feels like there's less filler. You take more time to craft and tell a story. Yeah, we right? couldn't have never gotten that last story about the gargoyles as at its length with mm-hmm. any of these others, I don't think. So I'm yeah. glad it was only three. But speaking of which, three cast members of this movie also appeared in Tales from the Dark Side series. Uh, and that was Debbie Harry, who appeared and Christian Slater, as well as William Hickey, that the older mansion holder owner guy. It's interesting. I would like to see those episodes. I, I really think I'm going to go back and like watch the show. Like yeah. I want to. I'm wondering why. I mean, Debbie Harry was a little flat, but I mean, I'm wondering why she didn't just like continue with that acting streak. Well, I mean, I like Debbie Harry mostly because I'm a huge Blondie fan, right? I feel, I mean, like I love Blondie and I love Debbie Harry as a person, as a persona, but the movies that I've seen her in while she's captivating, she's not a great actress. No, she's right? a little, like I said, she's a little flat. Eventually we're going to watch and talk about Videodrome, right? And while she's integral in that movie and also captivating as an actress to look at, her acting performance is kind of... Yeah. Flat, as you say. So Yeah. I don't want to say bad. No. She said it wasn't bad in this movie. Serviceable. Serviceable is a really good adjective for what Debbie Harry was in this movie. Yeah. But I mean, that's just the wraparound, right? And I mean it it served its its purpose. And I feel like we got a little bit more of the wraparound throughout this than we did in Creep Show. Like that was really just the start and the end of that movie. In betwixt all these stories, we are like seeing the switch in this little boy right so it's a little bit more enjoyable a little bit more funny i think well do you want to walk through these stories a little bit i don't want to synopsize again but what are your thoughts or feelings about some of these uh stories yeah i think that's a good way to do it because i think that we pretty much laid everything out in the synopsis but i mean we can start with the first story lot 249 and just sort of like talk about the things that we liked or didn't like in it yeah this is my least favorite story of them all (laughs) Agreed. Um, the the mummy just looks stupid, cheap to me. The deaths yeah. are not scary. No, uh, when they're trying to hide from the mummy, they're not scary because if, if if the actors are not scared, which none of them really are. No, they don't look scared when they're being murdered. No, they seem kind of resigned to it. So the direction here for these actors in this story was not good. No, I completely agree with you. Uh, the thing I like most about this story is that this one has the the the. St- the most stacked cast, right? Yeah. And it's like, how do you, how bad of direction do you have to be to get people like Julianne Moore and Christian Slater and Steve Buscemi, you know, to like just understate everything, right? You know, everything with a flat, you know, expression, nothing's happening. I mean, it kind of feels like. I want to see the Wes Craven version of this where everyone's like acting like a fucking cartoon. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't sniff the chrysanthemums. <laughs> Or a Joan Crawford one. I mean, if a mummy's coming at you with a wire hanger, I'd be like, no wire hangers ever. I mean, like, for real. Come on, where's that level of acting? We need to do our own anthology series where it's just off of these like wacky hypotheticals. <laughs> Joan Crawford gets attacked by mummy. Oh my God, it writes itself though. I mean, <laughs> really. Christina, <laughs> bring me that axe. Christina, again, bring the chrysanthemums. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I mean, there's some enjoyable parts to this though. I feel like. 
well, I, well, I'm trying to think of an enjoyable part of it, but I mean, it's 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 fun to watch. It's not a bad segment of an anthology movie. Yeah. I've certainly seen worse. It's not boring per se. No, it's just under too understated. It's not. It's it's almost like someone like Stephen King's jadedness comes through in some of his writing. Mm-hmm. And it just bled into how every pore and seam of this story where everyone's just like, doesn't even care that they're in living in this world, let alone living at all. You know, and they're just kind of going through the motions of everything and not impressed at all that there's a fucking Muppety mummy running around the slab or something. They open up that thing and everyone's just like, Oh, Hmm. A mummy. Let me go back to arranging these matches (laughs) (laughs) and going back upstairs to my room with a view. (laughs) I mean, I guess like those are are they supposed to be like rich people, right? And the difference between him and them. I mean, like no, that's reading way too much into something like this, like fully. But I mean, I always like seeing Julianne Moore. Yeah, she was fun. And I, Christian Slater, she was kind of a bitch in this, you know. And that's that was great. Um. But it really was just like a straightforward story. Like even the gore in this like wasn't that bad. I squirmed a little bit when the hanger went up the nose, but after that, like yeah, that nothing. was it. Yeah, I mean that was because the they could have kept it. You know, based yeah. on some of the gore they had in the rest of the movie, they really could have kept it. But they just panned down to the floor where you just see blood dropping, and it's like fuck you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like he puts it up his nose. You see, I want to see up. the angel hair spaghetti of your brain coming, coming out of that fucking wire hanger. I completely agree with you. That's my biggest problem with this is that you see him shove that hanger up the nose, and then it cuts to the mummy's face and just him yanking. And I'm like, why can't we see what's going on on the other side of the camera? And Christian Slater is like casually breaking off this guy, this mummy's limbs. Yeah. Right. Like snapping and, it. Like snapping. And I'm like, if that was that easy, like you could have like sneezed at the thing and it wouldn't have hurt you. Yeah. I mean, like, the less, stakes. you know, stuff you with chrysanthemums. <laughs> <laughs> stuff you Christian Slater. <laughs> the word of the day is chrysanthemums. Stuffed. No. <laughs> No, that's my word every other day. Today, I'm choosing a new one. Stuck with cat. <laughs> that black pussy and chrysanthemums. Which is a good way to segue to the cat from hell. Yeah. I mean. Right. And Stephen King's continual hatred of cats. Yes. And where in the world did he like, have you ever heard of cat stealing breath? He did another story, Cat's Eye. Yes. And, and, and yes, he, I've heard that before. It's a legend. It's like a cast to go and lay on you in your sleep or steal your breath or whatever. Yeah, it's a thing. Okay. I don't know where it came from. I've only heard I, that I think it's in a this urban movie legend. and that movie. It might be Native American. I have no idea. Have you seen Cat's Eye? No. Okay, maybe next time. I've October. seen the Cat People one or we'll, whatever. We'll add that to the docket. because that's, that's With that's... fucking Alice Krieg and the guy from Charmed. Sleepwalkers. Oh, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. Is that, Bar- he, is that Stephen god, King too? He, yes, he does love cats. I'm telling you. No, he doesn't love them. He hates them. He yes. hates fucking cats. <laughs> <laughs> Although in Cat's Eye, the cat is kind of the hero. So, Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, but I don't want to spoil it. I want you to watch that movie. Wait for next time. Well, October. you just did. Great. There's other stories in that anthology. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Cat from Hell is my favorite in all these three. Uh... It's right. It's it's my second place still. My 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 view of this movie is that it gets better and better. Okay. Unevenly, you know, there's moments of all of them that I like, but mm-hmm. I mean, at its best, this is maybe better than the others. But c- for consistency, I think the last one is. But I enjoyed this. I didn't enjoy the casting as much for this. I thought it would have been more interesting if they had different people or more more of a cast yeah or something maybe a larger i feel like this this story could have been its own movie yeah i feel like a longer version of this would be good because it feels like like the cat murders at downton abbey or something and there's a lot of potential in there they got some like you know gone with the wind actresses or whatever the beginning of it and i just wanted them to die because they're all stupid i don't know they're affected acting in this i just want to see like maggie smith being pushed downstairs by a cat you know oh my god i would pay good money to see that (laughs) oh (laughs) my dear no one cares about y'all pussy oh <laughs> no, I like this one because it seems the most. You pushed me down the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Pussy. <it. laughs> uh, my ass. I can see my ass. <laughs> <laughs> this story seems like the most directly out of Creep Show, the first Creep Show, right? It's filmed in such a way, the flashbacks are done in such a way, the acting is really over the top and kind of comedic, and it just feels like a Creep Show story to me. Yeah. 
And I like it. That one fucking actress who's like coughing the whole time. You know what I mean? She's yeah. like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it makes me laugh. And then it gets kind of gross. And like, I'm here for that. I liked that actor that, that played the millionaire, the D- David Johansson, I guess. But mm-hmm. I really would have loved to see like a Vincent Price in that role. Oh, you're talking about William Hickey, right? Yeah. William Hickey met rather. Yeah. yeah as, as Drogon. So yeah, William Hickey is like, a very, fa- very, very famous actor, right? And But most people nowadays would recognize him from this or like Christmas Vacation yeah. and shit, right? So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, like, it's kind of a missed opportunity. Find someone older from like 50s and 60s horror to do something like this. Yeah. It would have brought a little class to it, right? And the, like my favorite effect probably in the whole movie is the cat going in and then out of this guy's mouth. <laughs> yes. Going in, it was so Muppety, but they had a real cat coming out of like a fake head. And that looked really good. And you actually. could tell at that ending scene where that cat's coming out. Like, yeah, it, it was a real cat and it looked fucking gnarly. Yeah. My favorite Muppety moment from the cat from hell is when it latches onto his fucking balls <laughs> oh, yeah, like, and like swipes at his dick and shit. His dick. <laughs> dick. <laughs> I like when it attaches to his face before it goes on his mouth because it's like a face hugger. He's like wandering around the screen clutching at this cat. And it's just like really fucking over the top. It is. It's super Muppety though. The tail is like, it's I mean, been like, great to watch with you because I was just sitting there like staring slack jawed at this whole fucking thing and being like what are we watching oh no i was fully under some substance and was cracking up like i remember watching this movie when i was a kid and being scared at some moments right but this movie i mean it's from its time and i mean it was kind of the best we had at the time right and it, it truly frightened me and stayed with me for a very long time and i've watched it a lot i haven't watched it in many many years and so watching some of these moments from the cat from hell i was just like just dying and i was like i can't tell if this is supposed to be like serious horror or like slapstick horror comedy yeah but that's kind of what horror anthology is at its core anyway there's little moments of all those things yeah. right so perfect well moving on to lover's vow which is a really, really good segment. Yeah. You know, in, in, you know, originally the story I, th- I believe is, you know, a Japanese folk story called Yuki Ona. Uh, but the writer Michael McDowell decided to make a uh, Corolla into a gargoyle instead of a ghost, like in the Japanese legend. Okay. Right. So it's very interesting that a ghost could become, you know, real. And then when you question it or break a vow, then it, becomes less so kind of reminds me of some of the recent japanese or actually korean i think south korean movies i've watched recently like the wailing and stuff like that which you still need to see i really need to see on some of those yeah i really like this story i feel like this is the most like fleshed out like fully realized story in the movie it is yeah it's the magnum opus it is and i well you're right i mean like i may not like it the most but i can definitely see how it could be the best right yeah i feel like as far as characters go and storyline goes it's it's, it's a really really good it wasn't story. written to be the last story really as far as i know like it was a different order and they changed it based on um theater reactions wow so i think they wanted something where the audience is going huh at the end versus ew mm-hmm. you know and it's good. It's sad, too. I mean, like, I, I really enjoy the characters in this. And I, I think the acting is really good. I feel like the gargoyle itself is Muppety. full on Muppet. Oh, my God. The Muppetry. The Muppetry. The sheer Muppetry. And big Disney eyes, too. Like, yes. come on. This thing does not look scary. I mean, I took a screenshot or I, I took a... I saved an image from Google and sent it to someone and they're like, Oh, it's cute. I kind of want to hug it. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't want to do that. If you're going to give something fucking wings, give it fucking wings. You know what I mean? Like I, I hate seeing these movie monsters where this is giant fucking body and tiny little, like equivalent of T-Rex arms or whatever for wings. <laughs> and I'm just like, stop it. Those wings should be like part of the most terrifying part of it. You know, it shouldn't be like these little flappy, <laughs> little flappy things in the back. Just adds to the whole Muppetry, you know, it does. And so it like walks up to him and, and it's just like, I'm going to spare your life, but you have to do this. And I was just like, it is kind of cute, you know? So, I mean, like, I'm not truly horrified. I was certainly not horrified of the the, the kid gargoyles. I was like, they're also extra cute because they're small. It also kind of, if you think about this too much, it just kind of falls apart, unlike the other ones. Yeah. You know, I like that the cat was there as kind of like the spirit of all cats or something, right. you know, that came back. And uh, it actually reminds me of a really cool um, bonus that came out with two bonus episodes to the Sandman. And one of them is all about cats and the cat's dreams and what the cats are thinking about humans and and things like that. 
and how if like this cat can spread to even just a thousand cats and they all dream the same reality at once where there's giant cats and they're just like toying with humans and eating them raw and everything like that, that they can make that a reality. And the reality will be not have changed from the human uh, reality, but will have always been because that's how the dream works. Once you dream something to reality, it's the way everything has always been ever. Oh my God. Right. And so it's a really, really interesting episode. And it just kind of reminds me of that. And it kind of, some of these kind of remind me of some of the anthology episodes that were within Sandman in a way, kind of remind me of kind of a creep show kind of vibe or a Stephen King kind of vibe, you know? And so I, I have to impress upon you again to watch that show. I really have to watch that show. I mean, and like, I, I fully want to, it's, it's high on my list, but every time you talk about it, I'm like more and more. Yeah. Yes. I'm Another one of those man. anthology episodes. It's actually the same <clears throat> one I think was, um, uh, someone had captured a muse to, to make them right. Actually, Derek Jacobi, one of our most important gays. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he was passing that on to another writer who, was on a writer's block and was under the gun to make art because his agent was going to drop him because he couldn't sell his books and he was just taking money. Kind of like this, this last episode where it was a starving artist who's under the gun, you know? And so what happens when you've captured this muse who is, you know, a minor goddess and essentially raping her for her, for her power essentially. And then what happens if her husband from a thousand years ago was, the king of dreams and what the king of dreams will do to you, <laughs> you know? And so it's really interesting kind of mythology, folklore kind of stuff that, you know, Romero and uh, Stephen King, you know, kind of play around with sometimes, you know, I, I really do believe that Neil Gaiman is kind of a contemporary of these people. Well, he is fully. And I, I feel like they all sort of like influence each other, right? From that time period. We've talked about that many times on the podcast. Sure. About how contemporary, even just in A Nightmare on Elm Street, we talked about how it, it could have influenced things like it, right? These people all pay attention to each other and they sort of like work off of it. And I mean, in this particular segment of this movie, um, the thing I like the most about it is like that gargoyle, like watching him from afar, like this gargoyle is clearly sentient. The gargoyle is scary in and of itself when it becomes yeah. not stone. It's Muppety. Yes. But the idea that it's watching him and it sort of planned out everything that it did, like it killed his friend and imposed itself upon this person because it was already in love with him. Right. That's, I guess that's where it doesn't fall apart. Cause it's like, why would it kill the, his friend? Like why, what is it doing coming back to life to just kill someone and then go to this other random person and say this. No, it wanted and him. I guess that's the thing. I was like, is it part of like a sacrifice to become human? It has to kill life. And it didn't want to do any more than necessary, but maybe you're right. Maybe it was watching him and fell in love with him. I mean, that's and, what I get from it. And put him in the state to, to be able to make a vow like that. I don't know. Why did it have to kill anyone to do so? It could have scared the shit out of him anyway. Yeah. Without killing anyone. It's true. It scratched the shit out of his chest. It did. And I mean, and his friend was dead. Maybe you she was just like, I took off a nipple. <laughs> you are like, dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, I don't need the competition for attention. I'm going to go ahead and kill this friend. And then we'll be lovers. Yeah. I'll help him through this hard time. But I mean, like, how did you feel about the moments when Radon Chong was transforming back into the gargoyle? Oh, uh, that was better. It was like a classic werewolf transformation. I, I thought it was done fairly well. I, I agree. I thought it was it was okay. It was certainly less Muppet Muppety than the actual gargoyle. Itself. It was also kind of gross, which was nice. Yeah, skin tearing off of things is kind of nasty. I would have liked to see that happen to the children, but I'm also not a pregnant lady. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, we shouldn't wish well, based for on recent yeah. conversations. <laughs> right. That would have been a maybe a little too much, but I, I would have loved for one of them to have like a head brace like pop off or something as they become a guard. I don't know. But <laughs> it's like a little gargoyle with braces on. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Let's rewrite this movie. Let's do this again. It's the small details that really just do it. I mean, <laughs> in any film. But we have the conclusion of the wraparound story, right? So the witch is ready to like get that child in the oven, but he gets his comeuppance and we see the end of Debbie Harry and that's the end of the film. And I still enjoy this wraparound a lot. And I feel like it does a better job than even creep show. Yeah. I feel, I feel more fulfilled in this one. Although like killing that dad at the end of creep show is pretty good too. So maybe almost the exact same thing. Like the small child gets comeuppance on the older person trying to impose upon it. So. Yeah. 
Do you have any fun facts for me? Not really, you know. <laughs> um, I want to say, okay, the character Halston, played by David Johansson, is in the kitchen after his first battle with the cat and chides himself saying, can't get hot. Can't let yourself get hot ever. You make mistakes you, and you're, when you're hot or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So David Johansson is also known as Buster Poindexter. Yes. Obviously, the musician with many famous songs, among them the very successful Hot, 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 in which the singer pr- professes how hot, hot, hot he is. So... Thank you, God, because I was watching this uh, this last night and I was like, is that Buster Poindexter? <laughs> and I was just like, it looks like him, but I can't remember. And then I saw the cast and I was like, well, obviously not. But thank you. Great. Yeah. Now I have hot, hot, hot stuck in my head. So for my next one for these, you know, huh, facts rather than fun facts. On the commentary, Harrison asks Romero, if he recalls where King's short story, the ba- um the cat from hell originated, but he couldn't recall. So the truth is it was first premiered in men's magazine back in the 1970s. They printed the first part of it and asked readers to finish the tale. And then the next issue included both the winning entry and King's actual ending. So the story popped up in a handful of uh, multi-author and anthologies over the years before finally landing in one of King's own collections. I can't remember what collection that's from. I would have loved to see the winning uh, article. Oh my God, for real. I love Stephen King short stories. I feel it's where he is. I think that's best. a cool contest. Like I would have loved to. St- I, I don't hear about the types of things anymore, right? Because people don't read anymore. I mean, like <laughs> honestly, and we don't. We also we don't have magazines where authors are being published like that. Like Stephen King really got his start submitting these short stories to to men's magazines for a, a long time before he even wrote Carrie. Yeah, and so that just doesn't happen anymore. What we need is more people reading Playboy. Honestly. Well, this is men's magazine. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a men's magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like Stephen King short stories are excellent. And there are like a gobbledygillion of them. We really like stop making these remakes of movies that have already been made about Stephen King novels and focus on these short stories. I beg you, please, Hollywood. Like you could have an entire anthology series on TV solely based on Stephen King short stories and it would be phenomenal. Okay. What else? That's it. We're done. That's it. No That's more it. fun facts. No more fun facts. Well, they were they were fun, and they made me go, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things that made me go, huh? <laughs> Much more the latter. <laughs> That's right. But we have some questions to ask about Tales from the Dark Side, the movie that <laughs> we're going to start with. No, we're not going to start with. Where is this? Oh my god, we're not going to start with. Is this is the horror movie because clearly it is. But were you scared while watching this film? No. 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 I wasn't scared this time no. either. I was kind of grossed out in moments, but no. Nope. When I was a kid, though, I was pretty scared. I'm sure I would have been too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like I've seen I was this a sweet a summer child. Yeah. I mean, I do have a raging nostalgia boner for this movie. So um, that leads us into our next question. Out of five stars, what would you rate? Tells from the dark side of the movie. You know, there's there's moments in this movie that's like a two star for me, and there's moments that are like four star. So I kind of met in the middle and said three. Okay. Because I, I have no nostalgia lens for this. I've never seen it before. That's right. First time for you. First time 2022, right? So I'm looking at it with today's eyes, post Midsummer and Witch, and it follows, you know, eyes. And I'm so sorry. You know, everything else. And even watching things from around this time, um, you know, or even before, you know, 1979's Alien mm-hmm. or 1984's Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, things like that. And so I'm comparing it to all these things, uh, you know, things that came out before it, things that came out after it, certainly. And so I have to give it kind of a, a little bit above middle of the road. You know, I have to give it like it's uh, enjoyable. Right. Three for me is enjoyable. So I rated this film four stars. And I mean, a, a good chunk of that is nostalgia boner. And I'm not. And the other chunk is being stoned. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like this movie as a whole, as far as anthologies go, because we've talked about several anthology films on this podcast before, ranging from very, very good, like Trick or Treat, to kind of okay, like Creep Show, right? Yeah. If I was to compare it within, you know, I'm, I try to compare movies to every other movie, you know what I mean? Right. Versus like a vacuum in of itself or a vacuum in its own franchise. If I was to shorten this to just this franchise, I might rate it a little higher because I remember being actively annoyed in Freak Show, not Freak Show, in Creep Show a few times. Mm -hmm. Versus this show, I wasn't really actively annoyed. I was low-key entertained the whole time. It was more consistent. Yes. Because it focused, it was more focused, you know? And that is, that's exactly 
you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I feel like this movie consistently has good stories in it, right? And also a shorter amount of stories. I mean, Creep Show we have like five. This one we have three. I feel like if you take a smaller amount of stories and really focus on making them really good, it makes the anthology better. And I feel like I'm constantly entertained in this movie. Yeah. And um, I think that there's actual horror there, right? As as Muppety and kind of comedic as it is, that kind of fits the TV anthology vibe that was going on at the time this movie was made. And I feel like it checks off all the boxes that it needs to. And I really, really dig it. So four stars all the way. Yeah. You know, and it could have been cut a little bit in the first story and certainly in the last story a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, and squeezed in maybe a fourth story, but by then it might've been too much, might've been fatigue, you know? So I really think that this three, maybe four stories tops, you know, is, uh, you know, really kind of packs the best punch for me. How do you feel about rewatchability though? Um, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I might now I, I would watch it with friends. I would watch you it show it to people there? That's a better question. You know, if I was like, let's watch an older anthology or something, uh-huh. this random stormy night was something that happened in reality versus, you know, the hundred other movies I want to watch. Well, I mean, and with some <laughs> friends people, who would sort of appreciate I would watch it with you again. Yes. Okay. For, sh- for sure. And I wish I had actually. And we we can we can do that a couple of years from now. Yeah. But I feel like I feel like we know some people who would enjoy the the the, the muppetry of it all, and we would have a good time watching this for both its good and bad elements. I would right? watch this again in less than a year if it was with the right person, like with you. Okay. All right. And that that factors into my rating sometimes. I don't know too, how the, so. uh, that scales, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I know. You know, for me, it's still a solid three. Okay. And I, I I'll take that. It's not a, it's not a one. So yay. No, I enjoyed it. Uh, So finally, and some may say the most important question, who's the hottest guy in Tales from the Dark Side of the movie? You know, I think it's, for me, it's got to be Robert Sedgwick, randomly. I just looked him up and it's, yeah, it's Kira Sedgwick's brother. Oh my God. And he's like the rich douche. He's not really douchey, actually. He's like, no, he's just, you know, he's just... But he takes a shirt off. He's kind of dusted with hair, shorn uh-huh. hair or whatever. And he's kind of got a daddy vibe and he's classically handsome. I don't know what happened to him, but Robert Sedgwick for me is the, is the guy. I'm kind of torn a little bit between Christian Slater, who looks good. as He always looks kind of rodenty to me. I mean, a little bit, but he he's he's blonde in this movie too, right? Between the, the short blonde. rodenty man of that era, I prefer <laughs> Ethan Hawke. <laughs> Christian said he's also running around in like great gray sweatpants throughout this movie. And I was trying very hard to look at the crotch area of the sweatpants as I've been trained to do as a gay man. And um, there was nothing to be seen. So ultimately I have to pick James Remar like fully, you know, there was, there was a hot guy in each one of these stories. There was Christian Slater and Robert Sedgwick, you know, and for some of you out there that like that sort of thing, Steve Buscemi, I guess. And uh, you know, we actually had, David Johansson as Halston, who is kind of handsome. In a off kilter way. Yeah. yeah sure. And then um in Lover's Vow, we had James Remar, you know, and actually Wyatt, or who I guess the the bartender that gets killed, he was actually yeah. more handsome in he my was, opinion. He was very, very that's, attractive. Um, I think that's Robert Klein. And a very nice Or no, guy. it's Jer, right? Jer, Jer. Like, yeah. Ashton Wise then is the is the actor for that. Yeah, he was good looking too. Yeah. So there's Honestly, every anthology had had me something to look at, you know. I mean, thank you. Less so from the Cat from Hell, but you know. But the rest of them. He kind of reminded me like of a young Orson Welles, a thinner, younger Orson Welles or something. I can see that. Especially how it was photographed, because that one was photographed really like noirish. Yes, it was. Okay. I'm on board with that. All these choices are very, very good. So yeah, look for our TikTok whenever I post it. Sorry, I got us way off track there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's why this that's why this question is important. What if there was an orgy <laughs> with Robert Sedgwick and James Remar and Ashton Wise and David Johansson and Steve Buscemi? <laughs> Oh, you almost had me for that party <laughs> no, <I'm> just, <laughs> until I had to decline officially. I'd rather have movie. Julianne Moore. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have that black cat. I don't know. You. Well, I think that just about wraps up our conversation on Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. 
Uh, as always, we would like to know what you think about this movie if you've seen it and our conversation about it. You can find us on social media at The Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on TikTok. You can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or call our hotline at 972-666-7733. Suck at my brain and stuff. Mm, break off a piece of that chrysanthemum and stuff me. <laughs> Get gone. <laughs> <laughs> We have more anthology content coming out. I want you to murder my black pussy. (laughs) (laughs) I have a hit for you. Oh my god. I need to keep all that in. (laughs) As I was saying, we have more anthology content coming out for you this October. Next week, we are discussing 1972's British anthology film, Tales from the Crypt. That's right. With one of my favorite horror icons, the Crypt Keeper. That's right. And one of my favorite dynasty actresses, mm. Joan Collins. And the Crypt Keeper, of course, is played by Cindy McCain. <laughs> Cindy McCain plays a Gambia. <laughs> <laughs> but also, later this month, we have the return of the Film Flamers Top Tens. So stay tuned when we talk about The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. Dun, dun, dun. If you need some more Film Flamers content, please head over to patreon.com slash the Film Flamers and join the family. Get all of our bonus content. Get these episodes early. They've been coming out very early lately. So come over there and join the family. Right. You can get all those early episodes and all the bonus content for as little as two bucks. For a cost of a cup of coffee. Of- <laughs> <laughs> and finally, guys, we are inching ever closer to being able to be critics on Rotten Tomatoes. And to do that, we have to have at least 100 reviews on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. So if you feel so inclined, help us out. Go over there, leave us a snippet of why you like us, leave us that five-star review, and we're going to read those reviews on next month's Shooting the Flames. That's right. Well, Chris, it's time for me to go off and get stuffed. With chrysanthemums? Or a cat. I mean, dealer's choice. Okay, well... Black pussy it is. You want to have some uh, sweet dreams. I liked how that Muppet Garwell was so resolved. She was just like, well, you broke your vow. So. Yeah, that could have been a moment of fucking tragedy. She's like, ah. And she's like, wah, wah. <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> but you did, James Remar. You did. 